Welcome to part two of our operational amplifier clock build. If you haven't seen part one, uh, well, if I'm honest, it's not really a prerequisite for this part, but uh, it sure would mean a lot for me if you guys would also check that part out as well. I had a ton of fun making it, and uh, I think we learned some pretty interesting things in it. And this, essentially, what we learned was that uh, the resistor values that I was using for the inverters that I'd been building up to now were... <laughs> were not the best resistor values. So we just kind of updated those resistor values and did a whole bunch of testing. And so what I want to do in this part is actually build the clock that we're going to use for the vacuum tube computer that we're building. And the clock itself has some pretty unique requirements, which we'll take a look at a little later. But first, I want to take a look at our operational amplifier and apply the knowledge that we gained in part one to the operational amplifier and see if we can make it a lot better. So let's hop over to the bench, take a look at the schematic, and we'll go from there. Here is our new and improved operational amplifier schematic. Now fundamentally, this design is pretty much identical to the operational amplifier design that we built in the last episode. There's just been a couple changes. And so going from left to right, we'll start with our differential pair here. And you can see that the plate resistor and the shared cathode resistor here have been bumped up to 33,000 ohms each. Now bumping up the plate resistor of course means that we need higher value resistors for the voltage divider network that goes into the inverting amplifier here. And you'll see that's definitely the case. We've got 220,000 ohms going to negative 12 here, and we've got a rather weird value up here, 363,000 ohms. And much like everything else in the schematic, I arrived at these values through uh, several days of trial and error, which I, I'm sure is a terrible way to design circuits, but uh, it, it seemed to have worked in this case. And then the next big change you'll notice is that for these next three amplifier stages, we actually now have a cathode resistor on all three. So you can see that on the first amplifier stage here, we're using a 1000 ohm cathode resistor and then a uh, one nanofarad capacitor as well. And so what this cathode resistor does is it actually slightly elevates the potential of the cathode. So the easiest way to think about this is as a voltage divider with three different resistances, kind of like this. So we have our plate resistor of 33,000 ohms, and then as we discovered in part one, the, the tube itself is going to exhibit about 3,000 ohms of resistance internally, and then we have a 1,000 ohm cathode resistor. So if we start with 24 volts, and we assume that the tube is in full saturation, we can see that we have essentially a voltage divider of 33,000 ohms, 3,000 ohms, and 1,000 ohms. And so if we check the potential at these two spots, you can see that uh, on the plate here, we're getting about 2.6 volts, which is actually a little higher than the two volts that we were seeing with the cathode connected directly to ground. But now if we check the cathode potential itself, that's where our extra 0.6 volts is coming at. You can see that we get 0.6 volts on the cathode right there. So the potential of the cathode is slightly elevated above ground. So what this does is it changes the potential that the grid needs to be at for electrons to flow or not flow. Only slightly, though. Now, I fundamentally understand the idea of a cathode resistor, but why it changed the behavior of this operational amplifier, I'm not entirely sure. Again, this is another one of those instances of I know that it does work, but I don't know how. And you can see actually on the second amplifier stage, I use a different resistance value. I have a 3.3 thousand ohm resistance here. And the reason for this is I was getting so much gain through these three amplifier stages, which is fantastic because it's an op amp and we want a ton of gain. I was actually starting to get a ton of oscillations and the, the operational amplifier was, was giving me really weird results. And so I, through a process of trial and error, tried different values for the cathode resistor here, and it dramatically changed how the entire op amp worked. And so this 3.3 thousand ohm flanked by these two 1,000 ohms seemed to be the best solution. Now the final tryout is set up as our cathode follower uh, buffer essentially for the output, but you'll notice that we have two extra feedback paths right here. We have a 330,000 ohm resistor feeding back into the cathode of the final amplifier stage. And because the cathode has this resistor on it, this 330,000 ohm uh, resistor here is affecting the potential 
of the cathode only for this final amplifier stage. And this dramatically reduced the oscillations that I was getting. We also have a capacitor coming from the output all the way back over to the input onto the grid of the final amplifier stage. And so both of the, you know, this resistor and this capacitor, I, I didn't just come up with this. I, I copied this from the K2W op amp that we took a look at in the previous episode. And so this is our new and improved op amp. And for the clock, I'm ultimately going to need two of these. And it's going to be a lot easier to test them if they're on a circuit board. So I think it's time we hop outside and we cut a circuit board for these. So we'll cue the music and sit back and let the soothing motions of the CNC mill take us away. Right, and here is the result. So now that we've got it built up on a circuit board here, I, I want to test it. And we're going to do that by using the same negative feedback design that we used in the previous episode. So we'll have the operational amplifier set up like this, and the non-inverting input will go to a potentiometer to adjust our DC offset. And then we'll have a 10,000 ohm input into the inverting input. And this will just be a sine wave coming from my function generator. And then we'll have feedback coming into the negative input. And the value of this feedback resistor is going to be our amplification rate. So if this, if this uh, resistor is 22,000 ohms, we should have 2.2 uh, .2 times gain on the output. If it's 100,000 ohms, we should have 10 times gain on the output. So let's pull the breadboard out and hook up our circuit board to it and give it a test. All right, so I've got my operational amplifier set up right here, and I've got all these jumper wires to kind of just plug it into the breadboard back here so we can set up the feedback path. And right now I've got a 10,000 ohm resistor for the input and a 22,000 ohm resistor for our feedback resistor. And that should give us a multiplication factor of 2.2. Now with the old version that we made, we, we didn't see a correct multiplication factor, so hopefully this time it's a little more accurate. So let's go ahead and kick our function generator on. Now I'm using the nice scope here because it's got these awesome little peak-to-peak -peak, uh, measurements here on the bottom. And we can see that it's uh, the, the purple trace here, which is the, the direct input from our function generator, is showing 920 millivolts peak-to-peak. -peak. And then the yellow trace here, which is the direct output from our operational amplifier, is reading uh, 2.2 um, 2 volts. It's a little hard to read. It seems to be bouncing between 2.16 and 2.3. So that's, that's actually almost completely spot on. That is awesome. Let's bump up the amplification factor a little bit. Let's go from a 22,000 ohm resistor to a 33,000 ohm resistor and see how our output changes. All right, so now we've got the, the 33,000 ohm resistor in there, and so 33 divided by 10 is 3.3, and our uh, purple trace is still showing 900 to 920 millivolts, 
and our output is showing uh, 3.0, sometimes 3.1 volts. So that's that's really really close as well. That's awesome. That's that's working really really well. All right, so let's let's do the big dog. Let's go all the way up to a hundred thousand ohms. That should give us a ten times amplification factor, which means that we should see something like uh, ten volts peak to peak. So let's give that a shot right quick. All right, so now we've got the ten thousand ohm resistor in there. I mean, you can see that we've got nine hundred millivolts on our input, and we're seeing uh, about eight point eight eight point nine volts peak to peak on our outputs. So if we even if we change the scale a little bit here, this is now five volts per division, and you can see that's really really close. Yeah, we're off by, well, you know, 900 millivolts to see 9 volts on the output. You know, I, I'm, I've been rounding this up to 1 volt, but it's not 1 volt. So 900 millivolts to 9 volts on the output, actually the perfect amplification factor. This is actually more accurate than I thought it was. That's amazing. Oh, how cool is that? All right, well, that's working really, really well. All right, I am, I am just absolutely blown away with how well that operational amplifier worked. So now's the big one. Let's figure out why our clock needs such unique requirements. And to do so, let's take a look at the gate level design of our vacuum tube computer here. Now, the reason our clock needs such specific requirements is due to how the instruction register interacts with the logic unit. When the clock coming into the instruction register is pulsed, it stores whatever four bits of information are being input into it. And when those four bits of information are stored, the decoder here decodes that into an individual instruction. And for the logic unit, when that individual instruction is decoded, it comes in through a series of OR gates that ultimately goes to the multiplexer here that generates the result that we need to store in the result register. And so it uses the input from the, the instruction register through the decoder, through the OR gates, mixed with the state of the data, as well as the state of the result register itself. So there's a whole lot of stuff that has to happen before the result register can start the action of storing the result. So we already took a look at ensuring that the result register stores the value on the falling edge, but the value is still being input into the first half of the result register on the rising edge. So ideally what we want to have happen is we want the instruction register to store the instruction first, and then a certain set of time will pass, and then the clock signal for the result register will start. So the result register, the the input enable register, the output enable register, and even the skip register are all going to have their clock signal delayed slightly from the instruction register clock signal. So this instruction register needs to go first and then everything else can happen second. And so for now, we're just going to build the clock using a push button. And so when I push that button, that is a single input pulse but I want that pulse to be broken out into two separate clock signals. The second signal delayed a certain amount after the first signal. So if we take a look at this right here, this is my clock design. So I have my input coming into here and it goes through a standard inverting amplifier. And this is because the op amps are actually inverting op amps. So whatever the input comes into, the output is going to be the inverse of that. So I want to be able to push the button down for a clock pulse. But when I push that button down, that's going to send essentially the input high. But what I need is I need the input into the op amp to be high and then come low. And there's a small desensitizing capacitor on here to help smooth out that button input. This is essentially our debounce circuit that we built in a previous episode. Now that output comes out and goes into the first op amp. And this op amp is set up as a Schmidt trigger. Now Schmidt triggers are really interesting because they exhibit a form of hysteresis. Essentially, as a slope is increasing, the Schmidt trigger ignores it until it breaks a certain threshold. And then the Schmidt trigger goes to full on output. Now, as the slope is falling, it ignores it to a different threshold. And then once it cracks that threshold, it brings that output from high all the way back down to low. 
So it's a great way of turning a sine wave into a square wave. But what we're using it for here is to change a rising slope due to our desensitizing capacitor here into a square pulse coming out of the op amp here. Now that output pulse is our first clock signal, but it's also fed into another inverter, again with a desensitizing capacitor. And then that inverter feeds into another Schmidt trigger, which outputs our second clock pulse. Now the size of this desensitizing capacitor actually controls the delay between the first clock pulse and the second clock pulse. Because the bigger this capacitor is, the longer it takes for that, that rising edge to rise. And so we can fine tune this capacitor to match the specific amount of delay that we're going to need on our two clock pulses. Now I've got two operational amplifiers and I have some spare 686 tubes. And so this looks to be fairly easy to build, especially now that the operational amplifiers are on their own circuit boards. So let's pull the breadboard back out and see what this looks like in practice. All right, so I've got my two op amp boards stabbed vertically into my breadboard here, which looks hilarious uh, and, and kind of cool. I've also got my two 6AU6 inverters set up right here in front, along with my push button and then my two desensitizing caps. But on our oscilloscope here, the purple trace is the second op amp and the yellow trace is the first op amp. So if I push that button, we should see those move up and down. Yeah, yeah, there we go. All right, so let's... Uh, First of all, let's just slow this thing way down here and take a shot and see if we can get a nice square pulse out of it. Yeah, okay, so we can see that both traces go up and come down. Now this is 50 milliseconds per division, so that's, that's quite a long uh, pulse right there, but that's just because that's, that was me pushing the button. So now let's, let's zoom right on in and see if we can see the delay. Yes! Wow, look at that. Oh man, it's so cool. Look at this. So the the first op amp triggers and then this starts charging up the second desensitizing capacitor. And as that capacitor is slowly increasing, once it hits a certain point, the second op amp triggers. That is super cool. Oh man, that's really, really neat. Let's take another shot. That's awesome. And because we're using desensitizing caps and an operational amplifier, it is so overkill in the amount of debounce that we're doing. That is just amazing. How cool is that? We have two very clear clock signals. Man, that's awesome. All right, so let's look at what it looks like on the downstroke. Again, so the, the second clock signal is delayed after the first clock. But we were expecting that because the, the second op amp is delayed after the first op amp. So that's not, that's not too surprising. It just means that when we start thinking about clock speed, we really need to take into account this extra delay right here. Now, what is this delay? So we're right now we're at 100 microseconds per division. And so that's 100, 200, 300, just about a 400 microsecond delay. Now, I believe that's enough, but if it's not, I can always adjust the desensitizing capacitors to make that delay bigger or smaller. So the amount of flexibility in this design is really, really cool. Well, I am just absolutely blown away with how well this clock design is working and how well our operational amplifiers are working. I'm glad we took the time to do our due diligence and come up with a better design for them. I'm just so absolutely stoked with this. And I know it seems crazy to get really excited about essentially just two separate slopes, but there was a lot of work and effort that went into achieving this, and it came out perfect. I'm just absolutely blown away. This is so fantastic. So uh, I'm going to keep playing with this. I mean, I'm probably going to end up playing with it all day because I think it's really cool. But thank you guys so much for watching. This has been an absolute blast to build up this clock module. And we, we do have something really special coming in the next episode as well. So stay tuned for that, and uh, we'll see you then.